there right now. Wow. Support this man, Black Media. He makes sure that our stories are told. Uh, thank you for being the voice of Black America, Roller. Stay Black. I love y'all. All momentum we have now. We have to keep this going. The video looks phenomenal. See, this difference between Black Star Network and Black-owned media and something like CNN. You can't be Black-owned media and be scared. It's time to be smart. Bring your eyeballs home. You dig? Friday, January 13th, 2023, coming up on Roland Martin Unfiltered, streaming live on the Black Star Network. We're two weeks into the new year. The LAPD has seen three police-related deaths so far this year. A retired LAPD sergeant will join us to talk about the history of the LAPD and what can be done to change this department. We have an update on the Houston Independent School District School Board. They voted not to terminate Jack Gates High School Principal Tiffany Guillory. I'll tell you exactly what happened during last night's four-hour meeting. Student homelessness in the country has been a consistent issue over the past several years. We will speak with the executive director of the nonprofit Push Excel, which is launching an aggressive nationwide initiative to improve the lives of students impacted by COVID. Also, we continue our new you in 2023 uh, with Rodney Lennon. He lost 130 pounds and he makes it clear if you want to lose lots of pounds, you got to lift lots of weights. Folks, it's time to bring the funk on Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. Let's go. He's got it. Whatever the mess, he's on it. Whatever it is, he's got the scoop, the fact, the fine. And when it breaks, he's right on time. And it's rolling. Best believe he's knowing. Putting it down from sports to news to politics. With entertainment just for kicks, he's rolling. With the history of racism and police brutality in the Los Angeles Police Department, this year is starting with an alarming trend. Three people have been killed in two days. Takar Smith was killed on January 2nd. Oscar Sanchez and English teacher Keenan Anderson both died on January 3rd. LAPD officers fatally shot Takar Smith, who they allege had a knife. Oscar Sanchez was killed because they say he was threatening them with a metal rod. And of course, Keenan Anderson was tased to death. Chief of LAPD Michael Moore made this statement following the uptick in police related deaths. He said these cluster of events while miles apart deeply concern me. My commitment to the families is not just the condolences, though, is my commitment to ensuring the greatest transparency as possible. As much as, po as much as the law allows to include the details of the investigation, as well as the findings and my recommendations eventually regarding the actions of our people. Karen Bass, the new mayor of Los Angeles, is also raising her concern with this statement. We must reduce the use of force overall, and I have absolutely no tolerance for excessive force. We must also uh, lead our city forward, finally, on the mental health crisis that has been allowed to grow fester and cause so much harm to individual Angelinos, their families and our communities. Now, all three deaths are under investigation. Joining us right now is retired LAPD Sergeant Cheryl Dorsey. Uh, glad to have you back on Roller Martin Unfiltered. So when you look at that statement from the police chief, um, but you look at 
three folks um, already being killed. Uh, how do you square that? Well, let me say this. Uh, our police chief is savvy. He's used to doing these kind of uh, interviews in front of a bank of cameras. And understand this. He is nearing the end of his first term. He serves at the pleasure of this newly elected mayor, a black woman. He wants a second term. And so while he's saying all the right things publicly, at the end of the day, the buck stops with him. He will adjudicate all three of these uses of force. And he will determine what, if any, action will be taken. It could be something as simple as uh, officers being retrained with regards to the use of the taser and deadly force, uh, up to days off without pay, and ultimately termination. He has the final say with regards to all that. And we may never know, because he said he'll do what and say what he can as the law permits. Um, that particular point there about being, you know, media savvy, yeah, uh, he, he maybe wants to get reappointed by this mayor, uh, and by saying that, well, you know, this deeply concerns me. Uh, but again, when you look at her statement, the problem that I keep saying as well is you have to do something when you keep having these mental health crises and you have officers who are responding and they end up killing somebody. Well, let me say this about the three incidents, and they're all di different, so we have to take them each individually. And so I call balls and strikes. Uh, deadly force is not anything an officer wants to use, but sometimes we have to after we've exhausted all other options and means that are available. And I think in each of these instances, deadly force was used, as we're taught and trained, as a last resort. The problem that I have, however, with the two that involve the officers discharging their weapon is the number of rounds that were fired. We're trained and taught to fire two rounds in rapid succession and then to reassess whether or not a threat still exists. When the officers did use deadly force, they were confronting armed individuals. And I encourage everybody who gets a chance to listen to me to watch all three videos in their entirety. Each is about 30 minutes from varying perspectives of the officer's body cam. What are your thoughts about the, um, uh, the, the young man, the English teacher, who happened to be the cousin of Patrice Cullors, uh, the co-founder of Black Lives Matter? There are some who said, well, uh, look, he caused the accident. He was on cocaine. Uh, and frankly, he committed suicide by police. Well, listen, he was under the influence of cocaine and marijuana, according to reports. Uh, he was involved in a traffic accident and was acting very bizarre. Again, that video, too, is available to be viewed. He was running in and out of traffic while he was coherent enough to say they're trying to George Floyd me. He was also saying, I've been accused of killing CeeLo. Uh, they're planting drugs in my car. And so I don't know what actually was going on with this young man. Uh, I think the use of a taser was appropriate. I'm not sure that he needed to be tased six times. Certainly, there were sufficient officers on scene, in my belief, based on my training and experience, where uh, you could have dictated two officers each grab a limb and let's get this guy in handcuffs. No, I don't know if the cocaine in his system or any other pre uh, diagnosis that he might have in terms of his medical condition were contributing factors. But at the time of this incident, no one knew he was Patrice Coulor's cousin. No one knew he was under the influence of cocaine. And they did what they needed to do in that moment to keep him from killing himself because he's running in and out of traffic. Great made a point where you're talking about, well, should have been tased seven times. Carl Douglas, the family attorney, uh, was on yesterday, and that was something that I noted. I counted almost eight police officers who were surrounding him, uh, and I'm sort of thinking the same way you, same way you are. You mean to tell me that eight cops, one guy, uh, they can't actually sub subdue him without tasing him seven times? Yeah, that's the problem that I have, and that's something that they're going to have to address when this thing is investigated administratively. But again, understand, Chief Michael Moore has uh, total autonomy in terms of what he does with those officer or the officer who kept laying on the taser button, discharging those bolts into Mr. Anderson's body. And so, again, it could be something as simple as retraining the officer and officers on that department about proper use of a taser. So, you know, we'll find out, maybe, maybe not, how this is going to be handled uh, in terms of what discipline, if any, the officers are going to uh, receive. But I think at the end of the day, um, there'll probably uh, be culpability pointed in all directions. Um, uh, the, the, the thing that uh, I, we often talk about uh, on this show uh, r really comes to 
actions of police officers. Uh, and what I keep saying is, look, death is death. It, it is final. You don't come back from that. Uh, there's no check uh, that, uh, that that you're to, you're to come back from. I totally understand when officers are faced uh, with, with a life or death situation, uh, but I, I just think that in, in situations like you know like this, you got to be far more aware of that uh, and not just go to you know as as hard as possible. And, and I think, again, this is where, I believe, training, this is where expertise comes in. This is also where uh, humanity comes in. Absolutely. And listen, there was somebody on scene dealing with Keenan Anderson, uh, the gentleman who was involved in the traffic collision, who was tased six or seven times. Certainly somebody in that group of eight officers that I counted could have said just what I'm telling you now. Hey, I need two people on his arm. I need two on his legs. And, and let's get this guy into custody. Tasing is appropriate but the number of times that he was tased is problematic for me. And so the officer is going to have to explain why he thought it was necessary, because at some point, then it begins to look like punishment for not complying, as opposed to trying to get someone into custody for their own well-being. All right, then. Uh, well, again, we'll see exactly what happens uh, with uh, these investigations. Uh, Cheryl Dorsey, always a pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you so much for having me. All right, folks, we come back. I'll talk about this with my panel. Uh, we'll also talk about uh, some additional news, uh, including uh, what took place in Houston with the reinstatement of uh, uh, Jet Case principal uh, Tiffany Guillory. And we'll talk about, again, why it's important for people, uh, community, to come out and express their concerns and to show that they care about uh, these matters. Folks, don't forget, download the Black Star Network app, Apple phone, Android phone, Apple TV. Android TV, Roku, Amazon Fire TV, Xbox One, Samsung Smart TV. Uh, you can also join our Bring the Funk fan club. Your dollars make it possible for us to do what we do. Send check in money orders to P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 20037 0196. Cash App is dollar sign RM Unfiltered. PayPal is R Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered. Zale is rolling at rollingsmartin.com, rolling at rollingmartinunfiltered.com. And be sure to get a copy of my book, White Fear how the Browning of America is making white folks lose their minds. Uh, that, of course, uh, is available uh, at bookstores everywhere. Uh, and also, uh, I want folks uh, to remember, if you're in St. Louis, uh, our uh, we're going to kick off uh, our White Fear Tour uh, with a book signing uh, in St. Louis. Uh, we're going to be, of course, uh, with the St. Louis Urban League taking place January 21st uh, on at 3 p.m. And so I'll be with a Q&A with uh, Tef Poe uh, as well well as Michael McMillan. Look forward to that, folks. We'll be right back. Hatred on the streets, a horrific scene, a white nationalist rally that descended into deadly violence. White people are losing their damn minds. As an angry pro Trump mob storms the U.S. Capitol, we're about to see the rise of what I call white minority resistance. We have seen white folks in this country who simply cannot tolerate black folks voting. I think what we're seeing is the inevitable result of violent denial. This is part of American history. Every time that people of color have made progress, whether real or symbolic, there has been what Carol Anderson at Emory University calls white rage as a backlash. This is the rise of the Proud Boys and the Boogaloo Boys. America, there's going to be more of this. Here's all the Proud Boys, guys. This country is getting increasingly racist in its behaviors and its attitudes because of the fear of white people. The fear that they're taking our jobs, they're taking our resources, they're taking our women. This is white fear. Most people think that these television shows that, that tell stories about who we are as black men, and then they paint these monolithic portraits of us, they think that they're being painted by white people. And I gotta tell you, there are a whole bunch of black folk right. that, are, that are the creators, right. the head writers, right. the directors of all of these shows and that are still painting us as monoliths. The people don't really want to have this conversation. No, they don't. Hi, 
I'm B.B. Winans. Hey, I'm Dolly Simpson. What's up? I'm Lance Gross, and you're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered. All right, folks, uh, joining us right now, Killer Bethea, communication strategist, Michael Imhotep, host of the African History Network show, Matt Manning, civil rights attorney. Matt, uh, I'll start with you. We had Samuel Singawe on, uh, and he tracked where in 2022 there were more police killings than ever before. Uh, and uh, you see these folks who, uh, who are quick to make excuses. They're very quick to say, oh, why didn't you comply, things along those lines. Uh, but when you're a police officer and you have that much power, uh, when you literally can take someone's life and get away with it, uh, you might want to be judicious uh, in your actions. I agree completely. And it's funny that we're talking about this today, because when I get off of your show, I'm filing a lawsuit today where a man was tased six times inside an ambulance when he refused treatment after having an accident. Six times, black man tased. Uh, three officers holding him down. He was tased six times. What we find, Roland, is that with qualified immunity and some of the other hurdles that plaintiffs have in these cases, the issue is it's so difficult to vindicate your constitutional rights. We talk about it every week. But the problem is there's really no check on police who go way too far, which we're seeing across the nation as an epidemic. There's no check unless and until there are actually laws passed that don't allow them to escape responsibility. And this becomes a huge issue when you see that in this instance, all three of these gentlemen died with a stun gun. So that's important because it's not just people being shot uh, fatally with a, a handgun. You're talking about even less lethal or supposedly less lethal, less lethal mechanisms causing death. So we really have to have a come to Jesus moment about policing in this country. Um, you would have thought that after George Floyd that would happen, but we're continuing to see this. And we continue to see an uptick. And until these officers are held accountable, there will be nothing to disincentivize them continuing to use excessive force. And that right there, Kelly, is what it comes down to, uh, the outcome of the actions. Uh, and just all too often, um, you have excuses uh, that are made. You have the police union uh, that will uh, quickly uh, support them. Uh, and But, but you got to have accountability. I mean, at some, at some point, it's simply we cannot continue uh, of just saying, oh, let's just keep making, making million-dollar payouts um, in these cases. You can't. And frankly, those million-dollar payouts are coming from taxpayers and the likes and, or other people's pensions. And that's not fair to anybody involved, especially those who were not part of that incident in which, you know, basically an innocent was murdered at the hands of law enforcement. What frustrates me about these cases now, um, to Matt's point regarding George Floyd, and I think I said this on your show when it happened, I was frustrated even though I was elated by the fact that somebody was held accountable for George Floyd's death, it simultaneously frustrated me in that everything had to be absolutely perfect in order for justice to be served on behalf of George Floyd. And in these cases, there's so much gray area like there are in any other case with any other uh, set of facts that the standard for accountability was raised infinitely higher beyond beyond a reasonable doubt to the point where it feels like these victims of of law enforcement violence of police violence won't get the justice that they deserve because the standard is now so impossibly high so we need to have a come to jesus moment with accountability but we also need to have a come to jesus moment with what exactly is the standard to in court now and, and beyond for justice to be served, because right now it's beyond, beyond a reasonable doubt. Um, the, the, in the issue here, um, Michael, what, what we see again uh, continuing uh, is that when if your police departments, if you don't put real procedures in place, this thing is going to be like Groundhog Day. It's going to keep happening over and over and over. You also need to have, as Cheryl said, you need to have uh, senior officers on duty uh, actually use discretion, use leadership, and not allow things just to simply get out of hand. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. And I would, I would even go a few steps further than that. First of all, I'm glad you had Cheryl 
uh, on the show somebody who actually has experience being a police officer, because uh, unfortunately, a lot of times when these conversations take place, you know, you may have activists on the panel or, or things like this, but nobody who's actually been a police officer before. Uh, so uh, thanks, Roland, for having her on. Um, Yes, you you have to have accountability. Yes, you have yes you have to have policies in place, but to even go a few steps beyond that, you have to have officers who want to abide by the policies. Number one, and you have to have uh, those in leadership, sergeants, lieutenants, captains, police chiefs, etc., who will hold people accountable to the policies. Um, and and some of the coverage uh, surrounding uh, after the death of George Floyd and the uh, Black Lives Matter uh, protests and things like this, and various policies put in place in different cities. I, I heard people, uh, whether it's activists or even police officers, many times say. We've had um, different new policies put in place, but they also have to be enforced. So that's the other thing. And uh, w one of the things that didn't come up uh, in the conversation here, and I know you limited on time, is that also we have to put out a clarion call when um, there are police, there, there are police departments around the country that are hiring right now because they've lost police officers for various reasons, whether they left the profession, retired, what have you. African Americans, those who want to be the type of officers that we all say that we want to see, those who will preserve life, et cetera, we have to apply for these positions as well. And and a lot of those people are going to be the ones who will want to enforce these uh, policies and abide by the policies also. So it's a holistic approach to this. But Matt, um, uh, we're just unfortunately, what we just continue to see uh, is an escalation in settlements. Now, what is happening? Uh, we're actually seeing insurance companies saying, "You know what? Uh, we're going to jack up uh, the rates because we're tired of these payouts." <laughs> yeah, well, I haven't, I haven't seen that. But yeah, I mean, I, I, that is an issue, particularly because Kelly alluded to it earlier. A lot of times, this comes out of the city or the county's coffers, so there is a detriment to taxpayers. And a lot of times there's not insurance. That's one of the other issues that people don't realize. With most professions, if you commit um, an offense or you make a mistake, you know, even me as an attorney, I have malpractice insurance, right? Officers generally don't have insurance. So one of the problems for plaintiffs is if they sue an officer in his or her individual capacity, there may be a bona fide case and no one from whom to recover. So I think some of this is kind of, to Michael's point, a larger policy issue, um, not only in changing some of the policies and making people abide by them, but even requiring, for instance, that a city or individual police department has insurance policies to cover their officers so that it's not coming out of the county's coffers, but that there's something there if there's a bona fide case. And, you know, you see that issue um, as it relates to plaintiffs trying to recover in the cases where it's not a $12 million case. It's not a big million dollar settlement. There are a lot of things that happen that aren't six figure cases and the city or the county still has to pay out and they should be required to have insurance to do that. Um, that right there, um, uh, Kelly, really, I think is, um, is something that is critical. When we, when we talk about uh, these payouts, we talk about uh, how uh, these cities are responding to that. Uh, I guess, as I said, you know, we're seeing uh, folks say, uh, we're tired of this. What was also interesting, and I, I just get a kick out of these law and order people who also are so-called um, fiscal conservatives who are mm -hmm. real quiet with the hundreds of millions and billions of dollars in taxpayer funds that are being paid out. Um, those fiscal conservatives are conservative with their own taxes, so they're probably not even in the pot. So that's probably why you're not even hearing from them. It's kind of like those who live in glass houses need to shush. Um, but you're but you're right. The the issue of taxpayers carrying the burden of of these families. Uh, recovery funds like it, it it's going to get ridiculous if it's not ridiculous already and i worry especially in these major metropolitan cities where you're seeing um i don't want to say an uptick but certainly the hot, the spotlight is on them when it comes to law enforcement violence um i worry about who's really going to be footing that bill because you know rent's high everything's high uh, taxes are going up and eggs are expensive. Like, who's really going to be footing this bill? And how is that going to affect um, the the family's recoveries? Are they going to shrink the recovery amount? Uh, 
you know, legislatively speaking? Are they going to increase taxes so they can pay them off? Is there going to be insurance involved? You don't know at, at this moment. None of us know. Um, but it is concerning the fact that everybody's bending over backwards regardless without accountability being taken into account when it comes to these incidents. Um, again, uh, it, it, they continue and they continue and they continue. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, you simply are not seeing the level of accountability. And I and really, uh, Mike, we got 30, about, about 30 seconds. The issue that jumps out the most is that in this country, the laws have been passed and there, it, there are literally so many protections and Matt knows this very well. It is hard right. to pierce that when they, they are pretty much absolved of anything. That is true, Roland, but one of the missing elements here and the strategy that I think should be employed uh, and was missing when they tried to get the George Floyd bill passed through the Senate, even though Tim Scott blocked it, is each year, if you look at um, Fatal Force, which is the database from the Washington Post and information from CNN, et cetera, each year there are more white people shot and killed by police than African Americans. Yes, we're disproportionately killed. I understand that. But I think a strategy that should be used is talk about the white people who've been unjustly killed by police. Bring in those white mothers to a Senate hearing and talk about their baby unjustly shot by police, et cetera, and put a white face on it as opposed to just an African-American face. That, that's a strategy that I really think should be utilized and really has not been utilized widely so far. Yeah, but you also got to have white folks who step up to actually do that. That's a whole different story. I agree. All right, I folks, uh, got to go to break. We come back. We'll talk about uh, community action, what happened last night in Houston, uh, where, where we blocked the firing of the principal at Jack Yates High School. You're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered right here on the Black Star Network. On the next Get Wealthy with me, Deborah Owens, America's Wealth Coach, the number of people working from home has quadrupled to almost 30%. You're going to learn how you can now create your money space. It can impact your mood, your mindset, and your ability to get wealthy. Interior designer Nikki Koo joins us to share exactly what you need to do to create a winning workspace. Make a space that is going to instantly put you in the mindset so that you can be more productive, so that you're organized, so that you're inspired, or you're really focusing in on the task at hand. That's right here on Get Wealthy, only on Black Star Network. Next on The Black Table with me, Greg Carr. Our legal roundtable is back in session as we look at yet another potential landmark case being considered by the United States Supreme Court. This one is called 303 Creative versus Alenis and may be the most important and far reaching First Amendment, that is freedom of speech, case of our time. It could, depending on how the court rules, open the door for a return of Jim Crow segregation laws. It's true. If you say we can discriminate against one, you're saying we can discriminate against all. That's on the next Black Tape. Don't miss it. Right here on the Black Star Network. We're all impacted by the culture, whether we know it or not. From politics to music and entertainment, it's a huge part of our lives. And we're going to talk about it every day right here on The Culture with me, Faraji Muhammad, only on the Black Star Network. Hey, I'm Amber Stevens West. Yo, what up, y'all? This is Jay Ellis, and you're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered. <laughs> Darian Jones left his Dayton, Ohio home on December 28th, and he has not been seen since. The 16-year-old is 5 feet, 7 inches tall, weighs 130 pounds, with black hair and brown eyes. Anyone with information about Darian Jones should call the Dayton, Ohio Police Department at 937-333-2677, 937-333-2677.
Folks, last night, after four hours of a school board meeting, the Houston Independent School District voted 6-3 to three not to fire uh, Tiffany Guillory, the principal at Jack Yates High School. This was the vote. The school principal is discussed in closed session and authorized the superintendent or his designee to provide notice of the same effective January 13th, 2023. Is there a second? Second, Baker. We have a motion by Trustee Cruz and a second by Trustee Baker. Please vote. We have three in favor. Six, six opposed, zero abstentions. So with that, Tiffany Guillory will not be fired. She kept her job. Of course, she's been there for the last five years. Uh, the superintendent there, uh, he was uh, trying to move her out. They claimed, you know, again, trying to fire her mid, mid in the middle of the school year. They still have yet to actually explain uh, to uh, anyone exactly what the reason was. Clearly, the school board totally disagreed with that. But, but the thing here is that this, uh, I don't believe for a second that if it wasn't for public outcry, if it wasn't for us showing up at the school board meeting, if it wasn't for folks mobilizing and organizing, they would have fired her. The silence uh, would have led to that. Um, I want to go back to my panel here. And, and this is the thing here, Kelly, that I, I continue to say, and I've been saying this for years, so no one can say, oh, now you're saying this right now. No, I've long said that we've got to have folks who understand mobilization and organization, and we've got to be at those board meetings, school board meetings, city council meetings, county commissioners meetings, uh, state legislatures, you name it, um, expressing our concern. In addition, in addition to that action last night, uh, there was a discussion about the redrawing of maps. And they were talking about how Hispanics uh, in Houston want to use the overall demographics uh, uh, of the city to determine how the districts are drawn, as opposed to the number of citizens and people who are eligible to vote. All of a sudden, you go from almost 60% to 30% uh, there as well. So, and then, and so they were walking through this process, and there were some board members who did not like how the new maps look. There's, and, and look, I covered City Hall. I remember going to committee meetings, and there are so many things that happen that, that get passed and people have no idea about, and then it's only when an issue arises and people are upset and angry when we show up. But... Our, we're being impacted daily, and unfortunately, you don't even have news media these days where you have reporters who are assigned. So stuff happens, and frankly, people have no idea. We've got to make this a practice of going to these places and making sure our voices are heard. Absolutely. Um, you're right. You've been saying this for quite a while, but just to reiterate, even though it's not on television and in your face all the time, Local politics really are your most important set of politics because that is what is affecting you uh, most directly, most intimately. Um, just because, you know, President Biden is on TV all the time, not saying that he's not important. You know, your vote for president, your vote for Senate is just as important because federalism and, you know, this is how our government works. But when it comes to local politics, if you're not involved in those, the, that's when the silent heartaches and heartbreaks happen in your politics. That's how your teachers don't get paid. That's how your roads don't get paved. That's how, you know, ta home taxes go up and things like that. You not voting for the things that are affecting you most directly because you don't see it in the media as often, that is what's going to be most detrimental to our democracy, you not paying attention to local politics. So you're absolutely right. Get into those uh, uh, board meetings, those uh, hearings, those uh, commission hearings, those, uh, well, in D.C., your Ward 5 meetings, things like that, um, to make sure that the people who are affecting you most directly are actually representing you uh, the best and in your best interest. Oh, the thing for me here, um, 
uh, Matt that just sort of just drives me crazy. Um, and look, you know, I, I, I threatened last night. I told them point blank, you make this move, I will pull every dollar that I've given to the school and you will not get future donations. Um, and somebody said, they were like, man, and then I, of course, I also said, I will have my cameras here and I will have a report on y'all every damn week. Now, why is that important? It's called, if they have the power, okay, they're the school board. But when you voice, you use your leverage and influence. And this is why I've been saying to fraternities and sororities, we've got to be, we've got to have our organizations, fraternities, sororities, uh, Eastern Star, Prince Hall, Mason, all these groups where we're showing up in mass demanding to know what's going on and speaking up. Otherwise, our community gets screwed. And then after the decision is made, then people go, oh my God, what happened? Easy, because we weren't in the room. Yes, <clears throat> you're exactly right. It's funny, last night we had an event here in Corpus and Dr. Janella Butler, who used to be the provost at Spelman, said almost verbatim what you did, that it's incumbent on the fraternities and sororities and other organizations to help mobilize and galvanize the community to be there. I don't disagree with that at all, full stop. I think you're 100% right. I do think, though, one thing that happens with government and with politicians is that they leverage the fact that we don't know every single thing that goes on. For instance, in cities, a lot of times decisions are made by a city board, right? Somebody's appointed to a city board, and then the city council just rubber stamps the board's decision. If you don't know the board exists, then you don't know the genesis of that decision. And I think there's a dual responsibility. We as citizens have to be better about finding information, but also the government has a duty, in my opinion, to make that information more accessible. Michael, every week on the show, talks about various things you can find at Congress, and he's not wrong. I mean, those things are there to be found, but sometimes they're very difficult to find. And I think government has a duty to make it clear what's going on. Um, I don't know that we can ever have direct referendums, but you know, we're at a point now with the advent of technology where it's really not hard to apprise the people who are in your district as to everything that's going on. Choosing not to do so, I think, is choosing to leverage the reality that people don't always know what's happening, and therefore, you get to promulgate rules and policies that sometimes keep the power dynamic in, in place and or, you know, hurt the people unbeknownst to them. But people, but part of the thing here, um, Michael, the reason people don't know like we used to, again, is because we've seen the wholesale destruction of local media. Uh, I, right. I, as a matter of fact, when I was at the Fort Worth Star Telegram, there were two of us. Uh, there were two of us who were city hall reporters. Uh, you go places now, you don't even have one reporter. Lot, basically, no one is now covering. Uh, no one is covering school districts. No one is out here. No one is out here uh, doing those things. And so, um, uh, and so, the citizens really don't know what the hell is going on because you don't have. Coverage. It's just, it's not there anymore. Local media has been decimated. Absolutely. And it takes money to finance local media. The, the radio station, uh, the African History Network show is on, 9, 10 a.m. WFDF here in Detroit. During COVID, they had to get rid of their news department because, um, you, you know, during the lockdown, they couldn't go out and do interviews, things like that. We had declining revenue, et cetera. So they had to get rid of their, their news department. And when you see uh, local um, uh, media, local newspapers, uh, et cetera, especially because of COVID, you've seen them uh, have to, uh, if, they, if there was a situation where most of their uh, most of their articles were free online. A lot of them have uh, have had to go to start charging some type of subscription fee, okay, to be able to pay their journalists, pay their writers, pay pay uh, the people in the field who go out and cover these stories. So this is a, this is extremely important. This is why African American owned media is so important. And uh, what would happen? Uh, at the at the uh, uh, vote uh, for uh, Tiffany Gilroy, this is understanding politics beyond just voting. Okay, I, I talk about often how politics is the legal distribution of scarce wealth, power, and resources. Right, and the writing of laws, statutes, ordinances, amendments, and treaties, their adoption, interpretation, and enforcement. We not only have to leverage our economics, but also our media to be able to push our agenda. And, th and this is what you were able to do, Roland, uh, at, at, at the meeting the other night. So, you know, this is this is extremely important. And yes, uh, fraternities and sororities, et cetera. But, but lastly, I'll wrap up with this. Um, we have to, uh, if we just look at the critical race theory um, push by 
the right wing, by conservatives. That did not happen by accident. That was financed. It's heavily financed by dark money. They were very organized, et cetera, right? Organizing parents to uh, run for school board office, and then they're going to run for larger offices. We have to, on our side, we got to have a counter movement that does the same thing, okay? And that's something that's largely lacking nationwide, a counter movement to the anti-critical <coughs> race theory movement. Yeah, but again, if it's not being financed, it's not going to happen. Yes. All right, folks, uh, some good news. Finally, uh, after uh, four years of this show, uh, we have been nominated uh, for an NAACP uh, Image Award, uh, of course. Uh, and so uh, the, uh, here's the deal. It's now public. Go ahead and show it. So we're here, are the nominees. Of course, our election night coverage, uh, along with uh, other specials from OWN and ABC as well. And so here's the deal. Um, you can vote. The public can now vote. So I want you to do this here. I'm going to try to see if, see if I can do this real quick here. You go to my, go to my iPad. And so here's, your, here's what you You go to NAACPImageAwards.net. OK, what you do is you click vote and then what happens is you see all of the categories here. Again, our category is, out, is outstanding news information um, special. You will see right here, uh, this is where, and then you click vote. Now what you can do is you can vote in one category or you can go back uh, to vote in all the categories. Uh, and then once you're done, you can only vote via one email, just one email. And keep in mind, the deadline is February 10th at 9 p.m. Eastern. So I want all of our folks to vote for Roland Martin Unfiltered uh, to win the, Im the Image Award for uh, this category, Outstanding News Information Series or Special. Go to NAACPImageAwards.net uh, to cast your ballot. All right? You're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. I'm Jebra Owens, America's Wealth Coach, and my new show, Get Wealthy, focuses on the things that your financial advisor and bank isn't telling you, but you absolutely need to know. So watch Get Wealthy on the Black Star Network. impacted by the culture, whether we know it or not. From politics to music and entertainment, it's a huge part of our lives, and we're going to talk about it every day right here on The Culture with me, Faraji Muhammad, only on the Black Star Network. Pull up a chair, take your seat, The Black Tape, with me, Dr. Greg Carr, here on the Black Star Network. Every week, we'll take a deeper dive into the world we're living in. Join the conversation only on the Black Star Network. Hi, I'm Dr. Jackie Hood Martin, and I have a question for you. Ever feel as if your life is teetering and the weight and pressure of the world is consistently on your shoulders? Well, let me tell you, living a balanced life isn't easy. Join me each Tuesday on Black Star Network for a balanced life with Dr. Jackie. We'll laugh together, cry together, pull ourselves together, and cheer each other on. So join me for new shows each Tuesday on Black Star Network, a balanced life with Dr. Jackie. Hi, I'm Teresa Griffin. Hi, my name is Latoya Luckett, and you're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered. All right, folks, the D.C. family is demanding action in the death of 13-year-old Karan Blake. Blake was killed in Washington, D.C. on the 7th of January after a man thought the teen was tampering with cars. The unidentified man shot Karan, who later died at a local hospital. Though the shooter remains unnamed, Metropolitan Police say the shooter is black. The community is outraged at the police department. They have not released the suspect's name or charged him for what seems like a vigilante killing. During Tuesday city council meeting, Blake's grandmother, grandfather, Sean Long, said this about the lack of action. I didn't know you could get a gun permit and shoot someone for messing with the car. I'm black. If I were to kill a white boy in that street, they would have put me in jail. The police department's homicide branch is currently working with the U.S. Attorney's Office to determine if potential criminal charges will be filed. Matt, th this is a, a strange story uh, because um, 
it's you're basing it just what on on the testimony of uh, this man saying, "Oh, he looked like he was tampering with cars," uh, it, and and he hasn't been a, been arrested. It's this is people are like what the hell's going on? And I think they're justified in wondering that. I mean, this is this is pretty strange, particularly when you have a fatality for someone not to be taken into custody if they've given the police um, a version of events that seems questionable, right, or seems like the police cannot corroborate. I will tell you, um, sometimes the effect of particular state law can affect this. For instance, in Texas, uh, you can use deadly force to protect property. I mean, that sounds absurd, but that's the law here, right? So I've actually seen cases before where someone was not prosecuted because they confronted someone who was breaking into a car at night and they shot him. Um, that actually happened a few years ago here with a DPS trooper. So it depends on the law. Um, I don't know how it works in D.C., but the larger principle is— Now, I remember, because you know, the issue with D.C. is that the U.S. Attorney's Office prosecutes. So you you got a different sort of thing happening here. Right. But, the, I mean, there the, D.C. is obviously a federal district. There's federal law that applies. But right. D.C. has local laws that are prosecuted by a federal, um, you know, federal authorities, right? So the U.S. Attorney's Office there prosecutes local crimes. Um, every crime there is not a federal crime the same right. way it would be federal court in Texas. But in any, in any event, what I'm getting at is it's just strange that when you have somebody who has, you know, attested to shooting and killing someone, particularly where it doesn't sound like it's been released that he was in any way threatened with force, that's pretty uncommon for someone to not be arrested. And I think the citizens are um, justified in wondering what's going on and expecting transparency. However, I would also say that I do think, you know, people need to let the investigation run its course to an extent, because there may be some evidence there that uh, they're unaware of that justifies this for some reason in the police's eyes. But I don't see that based on the basic story, if someone was allegedly tampering with cars or was shot and killed for that, unless state law, or rather D.C. law, expressly allows that, that to me seems to be a per se reason for an arrest. Uh, absolutely. And so if somebody is, again, you, you're saying tampering with cars, but was it actually happening? And then to shoot to kill. Um, and so residents uh, rightfully um, uh, are outraged, Kelly. It, this actually really hits close to home, quite literally. I live maybe three minutes away from where this occurred. So it is conflicting emotions in that I get the local news in D.C., right? And there's been an uptick in crime regarding youth, uh, carjacking, uh, assaults, and the like. And then you have this uh, uptick in gentrification where people who aren't necessarily from the DMV at all are moving into areas that were and and still are predominantly black and and taking that gentrification culture into these black spaces. So how do you reconcile that? You one, you need to hold the person accountable who who shot this uh this young boy, um, because that's who he is. I hear a lot of young man and this, that, and like he's 13, he's a child, he's a young boy. Um, and, and he died virtually for no reason because no one should be dying over a car period. I don't care who you are. Um, but also, um, like your lower third says, um, word on the street is that he, the the assailant, alleged assailant, is a D.C. government employee, um, one who is not necessarily an entry level or uh, associate employee. So that the politics involved here are dicey, and it it casts a huge cloud over this case. In that, had it been anybody else. This person uh, who allegedly killed this boy would be in jail right now. And the fact that that has not happened is putting a huge taint on this newly elected incumbent mayor. So, you know, again, a lot of things need to be reconciled with this case. But at the end of the day, a boy is dead off of something that, frankly, we have no proof that he did because he was killed before he was 
even remotely held accountable for what he allegedly did. So my heart goes out to the family of Karan Blake. My heart goes out to the community of Karan Blake, the, the community that has surrounded him with love for the 13 years of his life. That is no more because somebody decided to kill him over a car. Um, and, and what we're dealing with, we're dealing with uh, a, a lot of people who are upset, Michael, people who uh, are angry with crime uh, in different, pl different places around the country. Uh, but to the Kelly's point, it's when you have somebody, somebody's dead and you kill someone over a car. But as Michael said, depending, excuse me, as uh, Matt said, depending upon uh, what the state law is, it's also a lie. Right. Yeah, because when uh, we were first talking about state law, Texas first came to mind because it was uh, I, I heard a case a, a few years ago where uh, as long as my understanding is the car is on your property, um, you can um, use lethal force. Yes. To, you know, somebody's trying to break into your car. Yes. It, 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 it does, does, uh, doesn't matter if they're trying to get, get mm -hmm. the, the moment they set foot on your property. Yes, you can yeah. use lethal force. Yes. Yes. Um, you know, in this case here, there, you know, I, I read the piece from uh, uh, CBS News. Uh, there's still details uh, that are missing. Um, what, you know, what prompted the, the uh, uh, person who shot and killed uh, Karan Blake? Blake? Um, what, how did things escalate? to the actual shooter. And he is African-American, by the way, okay? I think it was stated here. He is African-American, uh, the, 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 the person who shot him. So, uh, you know, there are a lot of details that are missing. Now, for, from my experience, and especially here um, in the city of Detroit, if you have a situation where you have a shooting like this, um, usually the name of the person who did the shooting is withheld uh, until charges are filed, generally speaking, from, from my experience with this. Um, but hopefully all the facts come out. And uh, if, if this person is uh, guilty— if, if this was an unjust killing, then absolutely they should go to prison. If it's a situation where it was, I'm not saying it is self-defense, but I'm saying if evidence comes out and it was self-defense, okay, you know, that's something different. But hopefully all of the facts um, will come out here uh, so we know exactly what happened. And then, you know, you follow the facts and, and, and hopefully justice will prevail. All right, folks, uh, the New York jury has ordered two, Donald, two Trump organization companies to pay uh, $1.6 million in fines. That's the maximum they could have been hit with. The Trump Corporation and Trump Payroll Corporation were ordered to pay the maximum allowed by law because of the 15-year tax fraud scheme orchestrated by the Trump Organization executives. Trump Organization was convicted of 17 counts of tax fraud and other crimes in December. Executives doctored the company's books to avoid paying taxes on lavish perks for Manhattan apartments, luxury cars, and private school tuition. Prosecutors did not indict Donald Trump, but uh, his a longtime executive is sitting in Rikers prison uh, right now. Uh, the wife of an Iowa Republican was arrested for 2020 voter fraud charges. Uh, Kim Fong Taylor, the wife of Republican politician Jeremy Taylor, who ran for Congress in 2020, was arrested and accused of three counts of fraudulent registration and 23 counts of fraudulent voting. The 11-page indictment alleges Taylor visited numerous households within the Vietnamese community in Woodbury County, where she collected absentee ballots for people who were not present at the time and filed, filled them out and cast those ballots herself. Taylor is also accused of uh, signing voter registration forms on behalf of residents who were not present. She's facing a maximum of five years in prison. Mm, knows how quiet uh, a lot of these Republicans are. Okay, folks, the Chicago Bears, they have a new team president and CEO. He is Kevin Warren. He will replace Ted Phillips, who is retiring after 40 seasons with the Chicago Bears. Warren brings a wealth of experience as he's worked with the St. Louis Rams, Detroit Lions, and Minnesota Vikings. Uh, in 2020, he became the commissioner of the Big Ten. Given the Bears' history of racism, owner George Hallis played a central role in the league-wide six-year black player ban. Now, Warren's hire will bring a level of diversity not seen in the Bears' leadership as he will oversee general manager Ryan Poles and the business operations. The NFL is still struggling with diversity in leadership with just four teams in 2020 having a black president and one black head coach remaining in the NFL.
And folks, Major League Baseball is mourning the death of former Philadelphia Phillies outfielder uh, Lee Tinsley. Tinsley entered the Major Leagues in 1983 and the Seattle Mariners, had two stints with the team, wrapped around two stops with the Boston Red Sox, and stayed with the Philadelphia Phillies in 1996. After hanging up uh, his hat as a player, he went into coaching. He coached with the Arizona Diamondbacks, and LA, Los Angeles uh, Angels, uh, Chicago Cubs, Cincinnati Reds, and the Mariners. Uh, Lee Tinsley passed away at the age of 53 years old. Um, folks, um, one of the things that uh, I uh, did also want to mention um, as, as we've been uh, talking about uh, these, these various stories, uh, today is the last day of public comment uh, for the, uh, the FCC looking at the, per the purchase of Tecna by Standard General. And of course, we had uh, Sue Kim, who was the Korean-American uh, who leads Standard General uh, on our show. Uh, and I actually posted something on, on my uh, Twitter account, and hopefully the FCC will see the interview that we did. Uh, because I do believe uh, that uh, that $8.4 billion acquisition could be quite beneficial to black-owned media and black content creators. I've long said that we've got to have more minority ownership, more black ownership of media properties. What I've also said is you've got to have partnerships, uh, whether they're joint ventures, whether you're talking about, uh, uh, whether you're talking about, uh, of course, M, you know, M and A, uh, different ways of working together. Uh, and so, if you missed the conversation, go to our YouTube channel, go to the Black Star Network app. You will see my interview with Sue Kim. Uh, there's been a lot of talk about he's not the right kind of minority. Someone actually said that, uh, but I can tell you right now, uh, I've had conversations with him, and I'm really hopeful that if they move this forward, uh, that you're going to see that because we do need greater distribution. We absolutely need uh, greater access. Uh, and then when you're talking about being able to partner with a larger firm, because look, we continue to battle these, uh, these ad agencies who continue to screw us over, even when it comes to the federal government. Trust me, I got a lot more to say about that next week. Uh, I'll tell you all about that. But this is one of the ways that we remain broke when we don't have access to resources, don't have access to distribution. Uh, and so that happens. By the way, um, we, uh, we signed a deal with MUXIP, uh, the company. They're actually handling... They're actually handling uh, our 24-hour um, uh, fast channel. Uh, and so if you go to Amazon News, you will actually see the 24-hour channel of the Black Star Network uh, on that particular platform. Uh, and so uh, we, of course, uh, partnered with them. Uh, and so this company, as I said, uh, they're handling uh, the back end, uh, which means that they're the company that we are uh, sending our signal through uh, to send through these other different uh, networks. And so one one of the things that uh, we are doing is talking to other companies. And so in addition to the OTT platform, which is you see with the app, or you're just on YouTube, we will, we actually have now a 24-hour streaming channel, which is on Amazon News. And, you're gonna, you know, and our goal is to be on five other platforms by the end of the year. All right, folks, we come back. We're going to talk about Push Excel fighting homelessness in America. You're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. When you talk about blackness and what happens in black culture, we're about covering these things that matter to us, uh, speaking to our issues and concerns. This is a genuine people-powered movement. There's a lot of stuff that we're not getting. You get it, and you spread the word. We wish to plead our own cause to long have others spoken for us. We cannot tell our own story if we can't pay for it. This is about uh, covering us. Invest in black-owned media. Your dollars matter. We don't have to keep asking them to cover our stuff. So please support us in what we do, folks. We want to hit 2,000 people, $50 this month, raise $100,000. We're behind 100000 so we want to hit that. Y'all money makes this possible. Checks and money orders go to P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 20037 dash. 0196. The cash app is dollar sign RM Unfiltered. PayPal is R Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered. Zale is rolling at rollingsmartin.com. On the next Get Wealthy with me, Deborah Owens, America's Wealth Coach, the number of people working from home has quadrupled to almost 30%. You're going to learn how you can now create your money space. It can impact your mood, your mindset, and your ability to get wealthy. Interior designer Nikki Kluge joins us to share exactly what you need to do 
to create a winning workspace. Make a space that is gonna instantly put you in the mindset so that you can be more productive, so that you're organized, so that you're inspired, or you're really focusing in on the task at hand. That's right here on Get Wealthy, only on Black Star Network. Hey, I'm Arnaz J. Black TV does matter, dang it. Hey, what's up, y'all? It's your boy, Jacob Lattimore, and you're now watching Roland Martin right now. Eee. Stay woke. All right, folks, Push Excel is uh, launching an aggressive campaign uh, to help students who are dealing with the impact of COVID uh, who are also homeless. The organization is dedicating to raising awareness to address the needs, again, of homeless students and building better communities. Joining us right now is Reverend Dr. Uh, Jeanette Wilson. She is the Push Excel's executive director. Uh, glad to see you, uh, Jeanette. So tell us about this initiative. First of all, how extensive is the problem? The problem is, is widespread all across America, both in urban and rural communities. We have discovered that there's a large homeless student population that we just kind of ignore. And I think in uh, two years ago, they decided to require uh, the uh, superintendents and, and principals to document homeless students in public schools. I talked to a school here in Chicago, 20% of the students are homeless. How can we expect them to learn? How can we expect them to do homework when they have no home? They are unhoused. Uh, that's the latest term. Also, you have students who are in college who are homeless. So when we go to winter break, spring break, where do they go? What happens to the meals that free and reduced lunches that they had in uh, elementary and high school or uh, food that they had in the, in the, uh, camp on the campuses when they were in college? They don't have it. And so now you have a whole population of people that tend to drop out, become frustrated, or just uh, very low performers, not because they don't have the capacity, but because they don't have the support. So um, so what have you all had encountered? Uh, and we talk about students. I mean, you're talking about um, elementary, middle, uh, middle school, high school, but also college, right? Yes, sir. And so the thing is... Uh, we, you know, our breakfast is designed to raise scholarship dollars and fund programs uh, after school and on Saturday. But when children uh, have no place to call home, no safe uh, place to live, we are creating a problem. And this became very evident in COVID because when you close the schools to keep uh, them from getting COVID, you say work from home. How can I work when I have no home? Uh, there's no electricity, there's no shelter for me, nor do I have the capacity as a, as a child to do anything about it. Homelessness is not something I caused. I was born into the situation, and I have no capacity to change it. And then I look at other children, and I feel like I must be invisible because I'm homeless. We provide for children who are juvenile delinquents. They get three meals a day and a place to stay. We do not provide for children who are homeless and have not presented a problem 
to the school system. We are pre presenting a problem to them because we're ignoring their homelessness. Um, I, I, you know, we, we've been dealing with, we, we've been talking about this here, uh, what we've been seeing across the country, frankly, uh, of, co of college students uh, having ho housing issues um, at, at various universities because they are, you know, overbooked. But the thing that also, again, jumps out at me uh, is that when we, when we talk about, um, uh, again, this issue, um, how per pervasive it is. And so you talk about, you, 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 we keep, is, again, I was just uh, last night, I was at the Houston Independent School District and um, I had somebody who was somebody who was some, some white conservative radio talk show host uh, who tried to be critical of us getting Tiffany Guillory her job back. Uh, mm -hmm. And he was like, oh, well, you know, you know, look at these scores, you know, and so she was running an awful school. Having, having no clue about the economic conditions of the students in that particular neighborhood. People don't realize the number of kids who literally come to school every day starving, who come to school and have not taken a bath or changed clothes or, I mean, we can go on and on and on. Right. Uh, and so, um, and, 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 what, and what COVID also did was uh, it, 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 it exposed so much uh, of that because when they couldn't go to schools, they couldn't get meals. They couldn't get meals. And think about this. Most shelters are not family shelters. So if I'm a mother with two or three minor children, I have a difficult time even going to a shelter at night with my children. They, I, one shelter, I, I visited shelters all night one night, one of the coldest uh, winters. And we saw children with their hands uh, pressed against the glass because they were in a room with other children they did not know but they were homeless also, parents in another location, women one place, men another place. We're treating these children like they've done something wrong. It's, you look at migrants at the border, we have, we have the same situation inside our borders with homeless, unhoused children. And it's not fair to the children. We must be better than that. And so I'm, I'm suggesting that pastors, you, they should visit the schools closest to their their churches or faith institutions, find out the homeless population, and then begin to see how you can help address it. At, at my church, as an example, we're going to start a dinner program. Children should not leave school having had the two meals that the school may provide and, and then uh, go to a place with no food. At least we can do that. Uh -huh. uh, so first of all, for, with this initiative, is there a certain amount of money you're trying to raise? Uh, no, first I'm just trying to raise consciousness. That's why I'm glad to be on your show because you're a man of faith. Uh, the Reverend Roland Martin, most people don't know. I no, have no, 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 that's my wife. I'm bootleg. She got papers. You're bootlegging, but got, you got a book. She got papers. She got papers. She got papers, but you got the heart for it. And, and so we, first we need to raise the consciousness. We, we talk about homeless in very detached terms. It is very personal with students. They didn't ask for it. They didn't do anything to deserve it. We must, we must do something about it. If I can house a juvenile delinquent and give them three meals a day, a warm place to stay, cool in the summertime, warm in the winter, and uh, a uniform, I can do the same thing for students whose parents caused them to be homeless. Similarly, colleges and universities must address the homeless student population. You can't just shut these dorms down, close the school down, say it's winter break, spring break. You go somewhere. Go where? And it's incumbent upon the corporate uh, community. It's incumbent upon the school community, the cities. We have vacant buildings in our cities. Open them up. Convert them to uh, homeless condos for students. Uh, questions from our panel. I'll start with you, Kelly. Sure. With this initiative, obviously, across the country, this is an issue. Are you, I mean, are there other cities that you are focusing on? Are there cities that have reached out and are interested in partnering? What is the, uh, what is the process with that? Well, I follow the Dr. King's model of nonviolence. First, we have to do some research to find out the homeless student population in, uh, in regions of the country on the East Coast, West Coast, which we know is just an alarming rate of homelessness, the North and the Midwest and the South. And then uh, there is an act that says that schools are supposed to monitor and document the number of homeless students. 
I don't know that they're doing that. Every state, every city, every county. And then secondly, we must convene our elected officials, the heads of these county boards of elected officials, city council members, need to be looking at homelessness in their wards, their legislative districts, and then we, we must reallocate resources to provide for it. Uh, next up, Michael. All right, uh, Reverend Dr. Uh, Jeanette Wilson, thanks for coming on and sharing this information with us. Uh, and looking at some of your information on your website, uh, uh, Push for Excellence was uh, co-founded by Reverend Jesse Jackson in 1975. And mm -hmm. then uh, also your, uh, I think it's your um, uh, chairperson is Judge Greg Mathis. Can yes. you talk some about the history of Push Excel, why, why it was founded uh, in 1975 and uh, some of your, beyond the breakfast, some, some of your accomplishments over the years? Well, it was started by Reverend Jackson and a number of educators, Dr. Alma Martis, uh, Dr. Mary Frances Berry, who was a uh, Civil Rights Commission for Education, uh, Dr. Alvin Poussaint, noted uh, psychiatrist, because it seemed that so many African-American students were not motivated to excel uh, based on their class, based on segregation and other factors Students just did not seem to be pushing for excellence. So Reverend Jackson used to visit high schools all across the country, and he would have the students say, I am somebody, I may be poor, blah, 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 blah. And then he began to ask students, why aren't you getting A's, and why aren't you studying three nights a week? Why don't you turn off the television? And they, they just didn't have the motivation. There was no parent-teacher collaboration where parents expected their children to go to school and attend every day and to do well, like most of our parents did. They didn't have teachers who felt that, I don't care how poor you are, I don't care uh, what your parents don't have, I expect you to do well in my class, and you can do well, and therefore I'm going to help you excel. All of us on this panel know our teachers. You got it. You have one great teacher, you remember her. I remember Miss Tally. Miss Tally. Uh, English uh, teacher and she remembered me she she I was speaking at a church she introduced me several years after I graduated I was just honored to know she remembered my name and everything about me that's what teaching was and so Reverend Jackson decided we have to get our young people to begin to see themselves uh, if my mind can conceive it my heart can believe it I can achieve it giving them those motivational phrases he partnered with. Um, I got about. I, 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 real quick, Jeanette. I got about okay. 20 seconds before I go to break. If somebody wants to support uh, Push Excel, where do they go? Go to pushexcel.org and make a contribution. You can text the word uh, MLK23 to 41444. MLK23 to 41444. All right. I appreciate it. Thanks a bunch, and uh, good luck with the breakfast uh, on Monday. Thank uh, you so much. Got to go to a break, folks. We'll be right back on Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. Folks, Black Star Network is here. Hold no punches. A real uh, revolutionary right now. Wow. Support this man, Black Media. He makes sure that our stories are told. I thank you for being the voice of Black America, Roland. I love y'all. All momentum we have now. We have to keep this going. The video looks phenomenal. See, this difference between Black Star Network and Black-owned media and something like CNN. You can't be Black-owned media and be scared. It's time to be smart. Bring your eyeballs home. You dig? People think that these television shows that, that tell stories about who we are as black men, and then they paint these monolithic 
portraits of us, they think that they're being painted by white people. And I got to tell you, there are a whole bunch of black folk right. that, are, that are the creators, right. the head writers, right. the directors of all of these shows and that are still painting us as monoliths. The people don't really want to have this conversation. No, they don't. Hi, I'm B.B. Winans. Hey, I'm Donnie Simpson. What's up? I'm Lance Gross, and you're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered. times have we told you on this show Republicans do not care about black voters, that they also greatly believe in voter suppression? Uh, well, we now see that as the case uh, in Wisconsin. Charlie Sykes is a longtime conservative in Wisconsin uh, who's been highly critical of uh, his party since Donald Trump uh, came to power. Uh, and he posted uh, this item today uh, on his website called Suppressing the Black Vote and Bragging About It. Uh, and in it, uh, he quotes uh, a, and this is the quote, this is from a Republican official named Robert Spindell in Wisconsin. He said, quote, we can be especially proud of a city of Milwaukee, 80.2% Democratic vote, casting 37,000 less votes than cast in the 2018 election, with a major reduction happening in the overwhelming black and Hispanic areas. Now, when you go uh, further down, uh, when you go further down uh, in here, uh, you will actually see, um, you will actually see uh, in here where they talk about uh, this, uh, th th this whole issue uh, and um, what this guy actually said. Uh, he said, um, in the city of Milwaukee, and first of all, he put this in an email, in the city of Milwaukee with the 4th Congressional District Republican Party working very closely with the RPW, RNC, Republican Assembly and Senate campaign committees, statewide campaigns and RPMC in the black and Hispanic areas, we can, and so the, the whole point about especially being proud of reducing it. Now, uh, this is what um, he did. He claimed that this was the result of a well thought out multifaceted plan that included biting black radio negative commercials run last few weeks of the election cycle straight at Dem candidates. A substantial and very effective Republican coordinated election integrity program resulting with lots of Republican paid election judges and trained observers and extremely significant continued court litigation. He also said, in a Democratic city or Democrat county where up to 80% of the people are voting for the Democrats, that's a good thing and helped ensure that Senator Johnson got over the goal line. Now, he wrote this in an email when contacted by the, contacted by the Associated Press. He goes, I will not stand for that. The last thing I want to do is suppress votes. But here is the thing, folks. Uh, that jumps out. This was one of the fake electors for Trump. But if you really want to check this out, watch this right here. He is a member of the Wisconsin Election Commission, the state body that oversees election integrity in the state. There are three Republicans and there are three Democrats. This is the thing that uh, I have been saying over and over and over again, that this is the fundamental strategy of the Republican Party, how they have been targeting black voters. And when y'all are watching these people out here who are commenting on stuff and who are, and, and again, I've been very critical of uh, these black people claiming they, 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 they super black, uh, demanding tangible, but telling you not to vote, they are operating as agents in, in with, with these people here. The work that they are doing is alongside these people here. And the misinformation 
Administration targeting black people is designed for this. Remember, Mandela Barnes lost, I think it was about 26, 28,000 votes. Had you had the turnout in Milwaukee, and in fact, Milwaukee lost about 50,000, 50,000 fewer people who voted in Milwaukee in 2022 than 2018. Now, now, I'm not absolving Mandela Barnes of anything because his campaign sucked. Their black strategy sucked. But do understand, it is a concerted effort by Republicans. I talk about this in my book, White Fear. This is a part of their strategy. This is what they want to do to African Americans. They do not want us to vote. This guy, Michael, is making it plain. He puts it in an email and he can't run from it. You're mute. Boy, did they... There you go. All right, go oh, ahead. Go, okay. go ahead. Yeah, I'm so glad you covered this story uh, today, Roland, because uh, I first found out about this today on uh, Nicole Wallace's show on um, MSNBC, and she had Charlie Sykes on as well. Um, this is a type of disinformation campaign, okay? And they, they, they bought ads targeting... African Americans to depress the vote. This is one of the things that they did, okay? Th this is why we have to be so educated and knowledgeable about politics and, and understanding uh, how this misinformation is fed to us to suppress our vote. If our vote didn't matter, why are people spending money to keep us from voting? And then you have the, uh, the, the black social media pimps who don't understand politics, don't understand history, don't understand law, don't understand economics, who feed into this and spread this to our people to boost their social media platform. So we got two enemies. We got white supremacists like this guy, but we also have ignorant black people who put this mess out here as well. So th th this is why your show is so important. You know, um, um, Kelly, when, when, we, when we talk about these things, we talk about what they do and how they're doing this, this ain't, this is not a one-off. This mm -hmm. is happening all across the country in multiple states, and black folks need to understand they're doing it because they are scared to death of our potential power. Correct. Um, and it's sad because instead of trying to find ways to garner our vote, to mobilize so that we... As, as black people could, dare I say, become Republicans, be more conservative. There are incentives for fiscal conservatism in this country, some of the key tenets of being a Republican. That's not what they're about. That's not what people like this man are about. They are about preserving the power based off the color of their skin. And because we don't look like them, they don't care that there's that black people aren't a monolith and that there's plenty of political ideologies to to spare to the Republican Party because we do not look like them because um, we are not white. They are not trying to have us in any type of right wing uh, set of politics. So it is it is sad, um, but it is expected. You know, Matt, um, and look, we just had the midterm elections. Folk better understand they are going to do even more of this in 2024. Black people need to be in position, need to be preparing for this and readying ourselves because the last thing they want is to see Democrats control the Senate and the White House in 2024. That's exactly right. And we need to, as a people, recognize that we are under attack. It's not coincidental. It's We're under attack. And this is a perfect example because this is a brazen email where he had the caucasity, if you will, to try to back it up and say, no, I'm not, you know, trying to diminish black votes. But you see it there written clear what the strategy is. So we do need to be informed and we need to be galvanized and we need to expect chicanery to come down the road because we know that's what Republicans are doing. They're playing for keeps. Um, as we've seen with all the federal judges that have been put in, and as you talk about on the show, all of the local races. And that's the thing that's scary, is that this strategy extends to the local races, and those have a more measurable effect, like, on your daily life, as Kelly mentioned earlier, about getting your roads, roads paved and all the services that you may need. So people need to be alert, and you need to understand that this is a game that they're playing for keeps, and we have to counter that by being galvanized, but being at the polls.
uh, in D, and, 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 I, and I could just, and I'm telling you, uh, you know, this, this thing um, it, it, it is major, and when people act like, ah, oh, you know, this really ain't that big of a deal, it is. Senator Ron Johnson now is going to be there for the next six years. Yes. And the reality is, had Mandela Barnes won, uh, Democrats would have a 52-48 majority in the United States Senate and would be there for a full six-year term. And folks, understand, as we move forward, as we move forward to 2023 and 24, you're going to see a shrinking white population in America, and you're going to see an increasing black and brown population in America. I purposely walk this through my book. There's a reason why I call it white fear, how the browning of America is making white folks lose their minds. The Republican Party today, folks, is essentially a white party. That is who they are focused on. Oh, yeah, you could do the window dressing. You could talk about, oh, there are five black Republicans who are now in the House. And you've got Senator Tim Scott in the Senate. But that doesn't matter. They are showing us who they are, and they absolutely want to dilute black power. You look at now how they're trying to redefine who is black to keep a second con black congressional seat out of Alabama. You see they're black blocking the, bl the second black congressional district in Louisiana. They do not want to see 60-plus uh, members of the Congressional Black Caucus. That is the last thing they want to see. And so we had better stop playing games, and we had better understand that we can ill afford as black people to be voting at 30, 35, 40 percent of our numbers. Those numbers must be at 65, 70, 75, 80 to counter the things that they are doing. Uh, that's why, don't forget, folks, to get a copy of my book, White Fear, how the Browning of America is making white folks lose their minds. Uh, you can get that book. Uh, again, again, numerous bookstores. Uh, you can download your copy from Audible as well. And then, of course, so next Saturday, January 21st, uh, my White Fear tour, uh, we're going to be in St. Louis. I'm partnering with the St. Louis Ur Urban League and also my man, uh, rapper and activist Tef Poe. We're going to do an in conversation with him and Michael McMillan taking place uh, at the uh, Urban League's offices, 1408 North Kings Highway. Uh, St. Louis, uh, Missouri, 63113. Uh, and so it's free and open to the public. We do want you to RSVP if you're in the in St. Louis area. So send us an email to info at rollinsmartin.com. Info at rollinsmartin.com. I will be in St. Louis again next Saturday, January 21st at 3 p.m. Free, open to the public. We'll do the book signing afterwards and in conversation discussing white fear with Michael McMillan uh, and Tef Poe in St. Louis. And of course, we're planning events uh, in Los Angeles, in Dallas, in Houston, other places as well. So we're really looking forward uh, to making this happen. Uh, hey, if you're watching on YouTube, I want you to hit the like button, y'all. We should be over a thousand likes, all right? Uh, same thing, are you on Facebook? Hit, hit the share button. If you're sitting here, uh, any of these platforms, we want you. Uh, to uh, share the information with us. Let people know that we're on and what we're doing. Because again, ain't no other show out here doing what we're doing, giving this kind of information. While they focusing on entertainment and what the hell Kanye is doing, we're actually talking about the issues that matter uh, to black folks. We also want you to support us in what we do, of course, by downloading our app, joining our Brina Funk fan club. Uh, Got to go to a break. We'll be right back here on Roland Martin Unfiltered, right here on the Black Star Network. On the streets, a horrific scene, a white nationalist rally that descended into deadly violence. Soil, you will not white people are losing their damn minds. As an angry pro-Trump mob storms the U.S. Capitol, we've seen shock. We're about to see the rise of what I call white minority resistance. We have seen white folks in this country who simply cannot tolerate black folks voting. I think what we're seeing is the inevitable result of violent denial. This is part of American history. Every time that people of color have made progress, whether real or symbolic, there has been what Carol Anderson at Emory University calls white rage as a backlash. This is the rise of the Proud Boys and the Boogaloo Boys. America, there's going to be more of this. Here's all the proud boys, guys. This country is getting increasingly racist in its behaviors and its attitudes because of the fear of white people. The fear that they're taking our jobs, they're taking our resources, they're taking our women. This is white fear. Yeah. 
Pull up a chair, take your seat. The Black Tape with me, Dr. Greg Carr, here on the Black Star Network. Every week, we'll take a deeper dive into the world we're living in. Join the conversation only on the Black Star Network. Hello, everyone. It's Kiara Sheard. Hey, I'm Taj. I'm Coco. And I'm Lily. And, and we're SWV. What's up, y'all? It's Ryan Destiny, and you're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered. All right, folks, we continue our new you in 2023. We've been featuring a number of uh, fitness experts and dietitians as well, uh, helping you out. Uh, we previously had Rodney Lennon on the show. Rodney, of course, uh, lost more than 100 pounds. Uh, you look at his uh, Instagram page and Twitter page, he often is talking about uh, really encouraging men and fathers uh, to lose weight uh, and to stop making excuses in doing so. And one of the things that he talks about a lot is, is that if you're trying to lose a large amount of weights and that is a large amount of weight which is anywhere from 40 to 100 pounds you really are going to have to be um, um, uh, lifting weights uh, to do so and so he joins us now from Atlanta Rodney glad to have you uh, and so Rodney we, 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 when you talk about that you and, I, and I've seen a lot of your videos uh, you're not saying hey don't do cardio I see some I see these other commercials that are running on YouTube and others they're like oh you're wasting your time on the treadmill because I've seen you where you say no I, I get my cardio in but you're emphasizing that and we had Cheryl Grant on the other day uh, as well as uh, Funk Roberts and they both they both said as you get older uh, you have to utilize the weights in terms of building building muscle mass yep because again Roland as you age the first thing that's going to go is your strength so especially as fathers, you know, you got a wife at home, you got kids at home, you got a career to focus on. So as you're going through that journey of dealing with all your responsibilities and losing weight at the same time, it's imperative that you lift heavy weights. Not saying you got to go be a bodybuilder or nothing crazy like that, but you want to lift the, the weights that can challenge you as a man. So whatever you can safely handle for anywhere between 8 to 20 reps that's what's going to help stimulate that good muscle growth. Because again, a lot of brothers are trying to lose this weight, but they're worried about having loose skin or being saggy or just looking like a deflated version of themselves once the weight comes off. But that's where the weight training comes in at. You can do all the cardio you want. Yeah, that's going to bring the number on the scale down. But when it comes to recomposing your body, helping you look totally different, making that amazing transformation, going from wherever you're starting at to where you want to be, that's where the weight training is going to come in at. So, so, we, so we're talking about, um, okay, we're talking about weights, okay? First of all, um, obviously it goes to how much. Also, uh, resistance bands. So let's say somebody doesn't have access uh, to weights. Your thoughts on the use of resistance bands? So when we say weight training, that's just one form of resistance training. It's a lot of forms of resistance training. So you do have weights. You have resistance bands. You have TRX suspension training. You have cables. You have machines. It's a lot of different things. You also have dumbbells and kettlebells, things like that. So all of those things fall under the category of resistance training, even body weight, air squats, push-ups, body weight dips, body weight lunges, right? All of these things are still stimulating some kind of muscle growth. When you stimulate that muscle growth, that's going to help your body overall, speed up your metabolism, help with insulin sensitivity, right? And also, too, again, going back to what you talked about right off the bat, helping you age gracefully, right? As we get older, the first things we're going to do is lose our ability to stand up or to get ourselves up off the floor, right? But this is where the weight training comes in at to basically delay that whole process for as long as possible. So... Um how many days a week? Because that's, that's one of the issues there. Uh, and then is it back to back? Do you spread it out? Is it two days on, one day off? What do you recommend? Me personally, I'm a big advocate for anywhere between four to six days a week based on how advanced you are. Four days is a great place for anybody to start. That's just Monday, Tuesday, taking Wednesday off, 
Thursday, Friday, take it Saturday and Sunday off. But if you're more advanced, you can do five days a week. That's Monday through Friday. Or if you're more advanced, like some of my other guys, because a lot of the career focused fathers that I work with, these guys have an athletic background, right? These are the guys who went to college, played ball. Uh, they didn't go to the NFL or they, they didn't go to the NBA or MLB. So they went straight to being desk jockeys, right? So these guys have the past experience where they can train five to six days a week and they can still stay relatively safe. So for anybody that's out there that doesn't have that athletic background, four to five days, is, that's the place where I like to keep everybody at. Um, so that way you can, you know, stay safe. You can have that work-life balance and also hit your goals in a timely fashion. All right. So for that person, for that individual uh, who didn't have the athletic background, uh, how, do, how do they start? Where do they start? I would recommend starting with machines, starting with cables. That's a more safer option because, again, you don't want to jump straight into the big movements like the dumbbells and barbell squats and deadlifts and stuff like that. Do the machines. They're more safer for beginners, so that way they can learn the technique. Their bodies can develop that resistance to that training. So as you start to you know, build up the muscle that can handle these intense exercises, then they can get more advanced and do more free weight exercises. But also, too, whether you're a beginner, intermediate, or you're advanced, everybody has to do that cardio. It's, it's no way around the cardio. And, so, and, and again, and, and we talk about cardio, uh, is it not? Now, now, I got to ask you this here because uh, I, heard, I heard you dog and walking. Uh, and I say I need him to clarify because and I talked about this here but, um, when, I, uh, when I was in Jamaica. Uh, I, uh, I couldn't, again, the golf course, don't even get me started how bad the golf course was. So I, I couldn't play golf like I wanted to every day, which is awful. And I actually only worked out in their gym one day. Uh, but what I did was I literally walked anywhere from three to five miles every single day. Um, and uh, when I came back, uh, my trainer was like, all right, how bad was it? And I said, well, actually, I lost seven and a half pounds. He's like, are you serious? I have also a guy I work with, uh, Joe Cheatwood. Uh, Joe dropped almost 40 pounds, and his whole, his whole deal was he was walking anywhere from five to seven miles a day. Uh, and so talk about that, because I think your video said you said walking is not a workout. So explain that. Okay, so when I say walking is not a workout, right, walking or non-exercise activity, that's the activity that we do outside of strenuous workouts or strenuous activity, right? So if walking was a workout, right? Every trainer in the country would say, hey, listen, you know, you're coming to me at LA Fitness or my private uh, gym for a session. Let's go strap on our shoes and we're going to go for a walk. That's not the case, right? So when I say walking is not a workout, it is a great form of exercise. It's beginner friendly, it's low impact, and it will burn calories. It will help you lose weight. But we're talking to people who are anywhere between the ages of 28 to 48, maybe a little bit older, right? You're still able-bodied. So a workout is some form of resistance training and some form of cardio. Uh, and so, and right, and right. So uh, again, what I think, again, how I saw what you're trying to tell people is, look, you know, again, if you're trying to lose large amounts of weight, yes, you can do your walk. You can do that, but you're going to have to, you're going to have to add something else to it because you also have to accelerate, uh, accelerate uh, that as well. Yeah. So the goal of weight loss rolling is burning calories. You want to always be burning calories all around the clock. So just using myself for an example, right? Not to pick anybody out or single anybody out. Uh, when I was working in the warehouses, banging my head on the wall to become a logistics manager, um, I would work out, do my weight training. I would do my cardio before work, literally lay around, do nothing all day. I would go into work with maybe a thousand steps for the day total. But by the time I got off, right, I would probably rack up 15,000, maybe 20,000 steps. I would have to literally sit around at work and do nothing to just get 10,000 steps for the day, right? But that's still, whether I got 10,000 steps or 20,000 steps, that still is not my main source of exercise. Yep, I, I got it there. Uh, all right, uh, so we're going to do this here, folks. We're going to go to a break. Uh, we're going to come back with questions from my panelists here. Uh, but, and again, so I want you to do this here. If y'all missed our previous segments, uh, I want you to go to our uh, Black Start Network app, go to our YouTube channel. Uh, you can see those as well. One of the things we're going to be doing, we're going to be breaking these out uh, and actually posting them as individual segments and then creating a series on our YouTube channel and the app. That way you can see all of them all grouped together. 
and, and we're not stopping this. Of course, we have our Fit Live Win segment uh, every single Monday, and there are other uh, folks we're going to be having on talking about these issues uh, because our goal is real simple, is to give you as much information as possible. I'm not telling you follow what Rodney says or follow what Terry Stark says or follow what Cheryl Grant says or follow what Funk Roberts says. It's really about what you choose to do and what you're comfortable with and that's really what our goal and strategy is and so that's what we're trying to do. And so we want we want to help you. And the other thing is this here, because uh, like somebody, matter of fact, somebody sent me a text and they said, man, uh, let's do a weight loss challenge. Uh, we can do some great content. And I said, no. So I'm not interested in that. Because really, it's not even really about a weight loss contest. What it really is, is how are you changing your overall uh, 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 plan? And I actually said this, I, I did a video on Instagram uh, that when I, was, uh, in, uh, when I was in Jamaica, I realized how crazy my life was in 2022 when I looked at how many people had access to me, who was texting me, who was calling me. So guess what? The workout was all thrown off, the eating was thrown off, uh, the sleep was thrown off. And so I made, I had to make these adjustments uh, in those other areas because they all uh, go together. And so again, that's really what this is about, is sort of just, just getting you to think differently about this and changing your approach. And so if you're sitting here saying, man, uh, look, I'm, I'm trying to change my diet. Well, if we can get you to drink more water, that's we have experts talking about that and the value a value of that as well uh, getting you to cut back and I think Rodney part of the reason also losing a seven and a half pounds in Jamaica did not do any processed foods for 10 days that's the piece as well so no cookies no chips anything along those lines and so we're trying to give you as much information as possible uh, to make you better uh, to make you healthier but also just to change how you feel and provide you uh, with more energy and so that's why we're doing this all right uh, folks uh, YouTube hit the like button Button. Uh, Facebook, hit the share button. Same thing on the app. Uh, you uh, support us. Download the Black Star Network app. Apple phone, Android phone, Apple TV, Android TV, Roku, Amazon Fire TV, Xbox One, Samsung Smart TV. You can also, of course, help us by joining our Brina Funk fan club. Send your check and money orders to P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 20037-0196. Cash app, dollar sign, RM Unfiltered. PayPal is R. Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered. Zell is Roland at Roland S. Martin.com, rolling that rolling Martin and be sure to get a copy of my book, White Fear, How the Brownie of America is Making White Folks Lose Their Minds. Download your book from Audible. And we're going to be in St. Louis, January 21st, for our White Fear tour at the St. Louis Urban League. A kid is at 3 p.m. Send us the RSVP info at rollingsmartin.com. I'll be back. Next on the Black Table with me, Greg Carr. Our legal roundtable is back in session as we look at yet another potential landmark case being considered by the United States Supreme Court. This one is called 303 Creative versus Alenis and may be the most important and far reaching First Amendment, that is freedom of speech, case of our time. It could, depending on how the court rules, open the door for a return of Jim Crow segregation laws. It's true. If you say we can discriminate against one, you're saying we can discriminate against all. That's on the next Black Tape. Don't miss it. Right here on the Black Star Network. On the next Get Wealthy with me, Deborah Owens, America's Wealth Coach, the number of people working from home has quadrupled to almost 30%. You're going to learn how you can now create your money space. It can impact your mood, your mindset, and your ability to get wealthy. Interior designer Nikki Ku joins us to share exactly what you need to do to create a winning workspace. Make a space that is going to instantly put you in the mindset so that you can be more productive, so that you're organized, so that you're inspired, or you're really focusing in on the task at hand. That's right here on Get Wealthy, only on Black Star Network. We're all impacted by the culture, whether we know it or not. From politics to music and entertainment, it's a huge part of our lives. And we're going to talk about it every day right here on The Culture with me, Faraji Muhammad, only on the Black Star Network. 
Hi, I'm Vivian Green. You're hey everybody, this is your man Fred Hammond, and you're watching Roland Martin, my man, Unfiltered. All right, folks, welcome back. Rodney Lennon joined us uh, out of Atlanta. Let's get started with our questions. Uh, Matt, you're first. So my question for you, brother, is uh, what is the optimal diet to make sure you build muscle but also, you know, um, have the proper nu uh, nutrients? And as a secondary question, what have you found to be alternatives when you were changing your diet that made changing your diet much easier? Like what things were you eating in particular? Okay. So the main diet that's going to work the best for you, it's not going to be a fixed diet. It's going to be taking the foods that you already enjoy and putting those into a structured regimen that you can commit to on a day-to-day -day basis. So the foods you like, if you like steak, if you like shrimp, chicken, fish, right? If you like rice or potatoes and broccoli and uh, asparagus, whatever the foods you enjoy, find the foods that you can stick to day in and day out. And those are the best foods for you to build your daily nutrition around. So one more time, can you walk me back through your last part of the question? Yeah, the second part of the question was what in particular did you find to be alternatives or things that you were able to transition to that you weren't already eating that you found helped you make healthier choices? So for me, I really just looked at the foods that I was eating on a daily basis, and I really just doubled down on those. So for example, when I was at my heaviest, 330 pounds, the foods after I uh, pulled all my bank statements and credit card statements, I discovered that it was only three main foods I was eating that was getting me overweight. And that was Mexican food, some kind of Jamaican or island Caribbean food, right? Or I was eating a lot of Asian style foods. So I started incorporating those foods that I enjoy already into my daily nutrition. All right, Matt, that's it? Yeah, that's it. Thank you. All right, Kelly. Sure. Um, I was just looking at your Instagram page and first and foremost, I love how you focus on black fathers because they are so necessary. Um, yeah. Black men, black fathers are just so necessary. And I guess my question to you is um, on the black woman side of things, we ha already have um, a lot of Talk, uh, influencers rather telling us, you know, give yourself grace and be kind to yourself and things like that. Um, I like how on your page you're saying, you know, do the work and, you know, go easy, not necessarily go easy on yourself, but what is some of the language that you use for your clients um, mm. to basically encourage them to give themselves grace in a world where black men aren't given that much grace, if any? Well, I just tell them to focus on the journey and not the right now. Because a lot of guys, they can get overwhelmed. They get discouraged. They get beat up by life day in and day out. So I just tell my clients to take it one day at a time, you know, one workout at a time, one meal at a time, and just stay consistent with that. Don't focus on what's going to happen tomorrow, next week. Focus on what you can do today, whether you're a man or a woman, right? Because I have, I have coached women in the past, and it's the same thing. You got to just focus on what you can do today if you have any slip ups, if you you know have a piece of cake or a cookie or a chip. Right. It's not the end of the world. You have to analyze hey, what happened that made me turn to these foods again, uh, analyze the situation and move on from it. Like keep it pushing and then work to make it the next day without doing those same things. All right, Kelly, that's it. Yes, sir. Michael. Awesome. All right, Rodney, thanks for uh, sharing this valuable information uh, okay. with us. Uh, uh, back in October 2022, I started um, back working out regularly. So I work out five days a week now. I've lost 15 pounds and probably okay. two or three pant sizes. Um, yep. So I do a mixture of, uh, in addition to cardio, I do a mixture of resistance bands and weights as well. Okay. Talk about the advantage of resistance bands when it comes to constant tension on the muscle as opposed to like free weights, but also how resistance bands are better for your joints as you get older. Well, resistance bands, they do have their place, but they are safer. They're a safer option for guys who are just getting into working out. They don't want to put too much strain on their joints or their ligaments, right? So they can be used both three ways, actually, before the workout. To, they can be used during the workout to keep constant tension on the muscle, uh, to keep you from pulling anything like that. 
And also, too, for stretching at the end of a workout, especially when, you know, it's very hard for us as we age to stretch our legs out and stuff like that. They can definitely be very helpful at the end of a workout to help you get a very good stretch and cool down from strenuous exercise. Okay, thank you. And, and, the, and the thing there on the resistance bands is, is the same thing with the weight machines, Rodney. It's yep. not trying to hurry up and get them done real quick. It's actually yep. doing a lot slower. Yep. Keeping that constant tension on the muscle, right? Feeling the workout, focusing on each body part that you're trying to develop because that's the overall goal, right? Some guys got certain body parts they want to develop, chest, their arms, their back, or whatever is the body part they want to bring up. But just being consistent with that, focusing on what you're working on, that's going to help you get that overall physique that you're working for. All right. Uh, pull this information up. If folks actually want to reach Rodney, folks, um, this is how you can do so. His Instagram and Twitter is R-L-E-N-F-I-T. Website, website is RodneyLendonFitness.com. Of course, email is there uh, as well. Uh, and uh, I, I, I'm going to ask you this uh, real quick. Uh, okay. I, I saw this, again, this story in the Wall Street Journal where they were suggesting that uh, kids who are obese should be, should be put on drugs. Uh, something tells me you would disagree with that. You say kids that are obese, right? Yeah, yeah. No, kids that are obese, man, this is why, again, this is why I coach fathers, right? Yes, I have coached ladies in the past, right? But, again, I start with the head of the household, because once we change our habits as men in the household, I hope you're in your household. If you have kids, you need to be in the household, right? But again, by us changing our habits, it's a trickle effect. We don't have to force anything on our children. We just got to set the example for our kids. Like my boy, he eats dead. I'm sorry. I don't want to curse on here, but he, my son almost eats everything I eat, right? And again, our children look to us. We are their first example in life, period. So yep. if you your habits, your kids will be greatly affected by the decisions you make. All right. Roddy Lynn, I appreciate it, man. Thanks a lot. Awesome, Roland. Have a good night. All right. Thanks a lot. Matt, uh, Kelly, uh, Michael, we surely appreciate y'all being on the show as well. Thanks a bunch. Uh, folks, uh, I will be in Wichita, Kansas on Monday, speaking of their MLK uh, event. So looking forward to that. I hope you guys have a great weekend. Congratulations to the Deltas uh, for their anniversary. Uh, the J AK's anniversary is, I think, what, Sunday or something like that? Deltas today, yeah. AK's on Sunday. Uh, and Don't so, get the Sigmas. Uh, yeah, but that passed. So we are talking about that. You late. You late. January 9th. No, you late. You late. You late. See, <laughs> uh, 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 all y'all could be in January, but it's only one that's in December. All right, folks, uh, we'll see y'all Monday right here, rolling Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. Of course, we always end Fridays uh, showing all the people who are on our Brenda Funk fan club. And so it's a lot of names. It takes a while. Here we go. See y'all uh, next week. Ho!
Phenomenal. See, this difference between Black Star Network and Black owned media and something like CNN. You can't be Black owned media and be skate. It's time to be smart. Bring your eyeballs home. You dig? Pull up a chair, take your seat. The Black Tape with me, Dr. Greg Carr, here on the Black Star Network every week. We'll take a deeper dive into the world we're living in. Join the conversation only on the Black Star Network. Hi, I'm Dr. Jackie Hood Martin, and I have a question for you. Ever feel as if your life is teetering and the weight and pressure of the world is consistently on your shoulders? Well, let me tell you, living a balanced life isn't easy. Join me each Tuesday on Black Star Network for a balanced life with Dr. Jackie. impacted by the culture, whether we know it or not. From politics to music and entertainment, it's a huge part of our lives, and we're going to talk about it every day right here on The Culture with me, Faraji Muhammad, only on the Black Star Network. I'm Deborah Owens, America's Wealth Coach, and my new show, Get Wealthy, focuses on the things that your financial advisor and bank isn't telling you what you absolutely need to know. So watch Get Wealthy on the Black Star Network. 